mani, gli acciami, tutti ampi, ambante, tisara nena, sa, pancia, silani, gli acciami, tati ampi, ambante, tisara nena, sa, pancia, silani, gli acciami. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. 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 Namo tassa bhagavato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sambuddhassa. Buddhaṃ saranam gacchaṃ. Buddham saranam gacchami. Dhammam saranam gacchami. Dhammam saranam Sangham saranam gacchami. Sangham saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi buddham saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi buddham saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi dhamma saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi dhamma saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi sangham saranam gacchami. Dutiyampi sangham saranam gacchami. Tatiyampi buddham saranam gacchami. Tatiyampi buddham saranam gacchami. Tatiyampi dhammam saranam gacchami. Tatiyampi dhammam saranam gacchami. Tatiyampi sangham saranam gacchami. Tatiyampi sangham saranam gacchami. Di sarana gamanam itita. Amabante. Pana ti pata ve ramani sikha padam samadhiya. Pana ti pata ve ramani sikha padam samadhiya mi. Adinna ta ka padam samadhiya. Adinna dana ve ramani sikha padam samadhiya mi. Ame su mitakara ve ramani sikha padam samadhiya. Ame su mitakara. Miccha chara vera manisika padam samadhyami. Musavada vera manisika padam samadhyami. Musavada manisika padam samadhyami. Sura mera ya manja pamada kana vera manisika padam samadhyami. Sura mera ya maja. Pamada Tana Vera Mani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Imani Pancha Sikha Padani Silena Sukatingyanti Silena Bhoga Sampada Silena Diputingyanti Tasma Sina Muxodhai Sadu 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 Yes, page 9.13 Sutta 114. Sevitabha Sevitabha Sutta, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Salati in Jatha's Grove, Anathapindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, I shall teach you a discourse on what should be cultivated and what should not be cultivated. Listen and attend closely to what I say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Bhikkhus replied. The Blessed One said this. First exposition. Bhikkhus, bodily conduct is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And bodily conduct is either the one or the other. Verbal conduct is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And verbal conduct is either the one or the other. Mental conduct is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And mental conduct is either the one or the other. Inclination of mind is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And inclination of mind is either the one or the other. The acquisition of perception is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And the acquisition or, of perception is either the one or the other. The acquisition of view is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And the acquisition of view is either the one or the other. The acquisition of individuality is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And the acquisition of individuality is either the one or the other. 
first elaborate. When this was said, the Venerable Sariputta said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I understand the detailed meaning of the Blessed One's utterance, which he has spoken in brief without expounding the detail to be thus. Because bodily conduct is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And bodily conduct is either the one or the other. So it was said by the Blessed One. And with reference to what was this said, Venerable Sir, such bodily conduct as causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish is one who cultivates it should uh, should not be cultivated. But such bodily conduct as causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it should be cultivated. And what kind of bodily conduct causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it? Here, someone kills living beings. He is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. He takes what is not given. He takes by way of theft the wealth and property of others in the village or in the forest for pleasures. He is intercourse with such women as are protected by their mother, father, mother and father, brother, sister or relatives who have a husband who are protected by law and even with those who are garlanded in the token of betrothal. Such bodily conduct causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it. And what, and what kind of bodily conduct causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it? Here someone abandoning the killing of living beings abstains from killing living beings with a rod and weapon laid aside. Gently and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. He does not take, by way of theft, the wealth and property of others in the village or in the forest. Abandoning misconduct in sensual pleasures, he abstains from misconduct in sensual pleasures. He does not have intercourse with such women as are protected by their mother, father, mother and father, brother, sister or relative, who have a husband, who are protected by law, or with those who are garlanded in token of victorium. Such bodily conduct causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it. So it was with reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One Bhikkhus, bodily conduct is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And bodily conduct is either the one or the other. Bhikkhus, verbal conduct is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated and verbal conduct is either the one or the other. So it was said by the Blessed One, and with reference to what was this said, Venerable Sir, such verbal conduct as causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it should not be cultivated, but such verbal conduct as causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it should be cultivated. And what kind of verbal conduct causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it? Here someone speaks falsehood when summoned to a court or to a meeting or to his relative's presence or to his guild or to the royal family's presence and questioned as a witness thus. So, good man, tell what you know. Not knowing, he says, I know, or knowing, he says, I do not know. Not seeing, he says, I see. Or seeing, he says, I do not see. In full awareness, he speaks falsehood for his own ends, or for another's ends, or for something trifling worldly end. He speaks maliciously. He repeats elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from these. Or he repeats to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus he is one who divides those who are united, a creator of divisions, who enjoys discord, rejoices in discord, delights in discord, a speaker of words that create discord. He speaks harshly. He utters such words as are rough, hard, hurtful to others, offensive to others, bordering on anger unconducive to concentration. He is a gossip. He speaks at the wrong time. 
speaks what is not fact, speaks what is useless, speaks contrary to the Dharma and the discipline. At the wrong time, he speaks such words as are worthless, unreasonable, immoderate, and unbeneficial. Such verbal conduct causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it. And what kind of verbal conduct causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it? Here, someone abandoning false speech abstains from false speech. When summoned to a court or to a meeting or to his relative's presence or to his guild or to the royal family's presence and questioned as a witness thus, So, good man, tell what you know. Not knowing, he says, I do not know. Or knowing, he says, I know. Not seeing, he says, I do not see. Or seeing, he says, I see. He does not in full awareness speak falsehood for his own ends or another's ends or for some trifling worldly end. Abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from these. Nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus he is one who reunites those who are divided. A promoter of friendships, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning harsh speech, he obtains from harsh, he abstains from harsh. He speaks such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, he abstains from gossip. He speaks at the right time speaks what is fact, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dharma and the discipline. At the right time he speaks such words as are worth recording, reasonable, moderate and beneficial. Such verbal conduct causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it. So it was with reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One, Bhikkhus, verbal conduct is of two kinds, I say, be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And verbal conduct is either the one or the other. Mental conduct is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated or not to be cultivated. And mental conduct is either the one or the other. So it was said by the blessed one. And with, re with, re with reference to what was this said, Venerable Sir, such mental conduct has caused an awesome state to increase and also state to diminish in one who cultivates should not be cultivated but such mental conduct as causes an awesome state to diminish and also state to increase in one who cultivates should be cultivated and what kind of mental conduct causes an awesome state to increase and also state to diminish in one who cultivates here some someone is covetous he covet the wealth and property of others thus or oh, May what belongs to others be mine, or he, ha he has a mind of, of ill will and the intention of hate, thus. May these beings be slain and slaughtered, may they be cut off, perish, or be annihilated. Such mental conduct causes an awesome state to increase, an awesome state to diminish, in one who cultivates. And what kind of mental conduct causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase and cultivated. If someone is not covetous, he does not covet the wealth and property of others as, oh, may what belongs to another be mine. Mind is without ill will, and he has intentions free from hate thus. May these beings be free from enmity, affliction, affliction and anxiety. May they look after themselves happily. Such mental conduct causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates. So it was with reference, reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One, because mental conduct is of two kinds. I say to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And mental conduct is either the one or the other. Inclination of, inclination of mind is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. An inclination of mind is either the one or the other. So it was said by the Blessed One. And with, with reference to what was, was this said? Venerable Sir, 
such inclination of mind as causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one to cultivate it, it should not be cultivated. But such inclination of mind as causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it should be cultivated. And what kind of inclination of mind causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it? Here, someone is covetous and abides with his mind imbued with covetous. He has ill will and abides with his mind imbued with ill will. He is cruel and abides with his mind imbued with cruelty. Such inclination of mind causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates. And what kind of inclination of mind causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates care? Someone is uncovetous and abides with his mind, detached from covetous. He is without ill will and abides with his mind, detached from ill will. He is uncruel and abides with his mind, detached from cruelty. Such inclination of mind causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one cultivation. It was with reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One. Bhikkhu's inclination of mind is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. An inclination of mind is either the one or the other. The acquisition of perception is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And the acquisition of perception is either the one or the other. So it was said by the Blessed One, and with reference to what was it? Venerable Sir, such acquisition of perception as causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish is in one who cultivates it should not be cultivated. But such acquisition of perception as causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to in what cultivates it should be cultivated. And what kind of acquisition of perception causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish and one who cultivates it? Here someone is covetous and abides with his perception imbued with covetousness. He has ill will and abides with his perception imbued with ill will. He is cruel and abides with his perception imbued with cruelty. Such acquisition of perception causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates. And to, what's, what is a um, kind of no, but uh, I mean, there should be a clear distinction between uh, intention, um, inclination and perception. I think it's just different levels. And you're basically talking about the same thing, but on different. With Sanya, you perceive it and perceive an object with this, the, the state. For example, if you see, I was going to say, for example, if you see somebody as his wife and you see her as beautiful, that's perception. That leads to leads to uh, you know breaking the precept. How does he translate the other one? Chitupada. Inclination of mind. That's not a really great translation. Chitupada just literally means the arising of mind. Sanya is maybe more related to the the habit. What sort of? Yeah, I don't really know. But the difference between Chitupada and Sanya Patilaba. Uh, Bhante, can we not think of it uh, in terms of like in the uh, noble uh, eightfold path, uh, Samma Vayama, not uh, uh, the unwholesome chittas that has not chittas that are not arisen yet, you prevent that from arising. And wholesome, unwholesome chittas that have arisen, you do not uh, further associate with them. So maybe that's true. I'm sure, but that what you just said doesn't explain the difference between these two terms. Like uh, Chittupada is uh, it hasn't, it is not yet the reason, but you shouldn't give rise to such thought. The previous one, it is something already. Uh, no, the, the one, the, the one we just did I, is Sanya Patilapa, I guess. Previous. Oh yeah, Sanya. Uh -huh. Sanya is. I think it. Um, it just has to do with, you know, there are many suttas where the Buddha describes things as going in order, like sort of like Paticca Samupada or, or basically Paticca Samupada, sometimes in more detail. And so I think it's just stages. So it's basically talking about the same thing, but at different levels. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. What does it mean to I cannot hear you, Sanda. What does it mean, acquisition? 
or perception acquired. Good. I think um, my understanding of this word patilaba is not exactly acquisition. It's it's a figurative way of saying uh, coming into like like uh, having it arise. Basically, I mean it's kind of just another way of saying upada, uh, but maybe not. Maybe it's um, that's what I was saying about it being like the habit. Sanya patilaba is like the the acquisition, the gaining of habits. The sanya relates to how you recognize something, and you only recognize something based on past instances of it. So with jitupada, it's just the arising of a, of a consciousness. So what happens when you get angry? What should you do about when you get angry? Well, you should, you should, that's not one you should not cultivate. But then it can go even further where you have habits. So you, you uh, see something and you remember how it made you angry and you get angry again. I mean, I'm kind of reaching here, but I, it seems there might be, uh, the Sanya Patilava might be, might be related to habits. So it's, it's saying the same thing, but it's saying, it's talking about habits as well. Like, like the Chitupada can lead to habitual arising. I'm just guessing. Patilava in a singleist means a yield or a profit or benefit or something. Uh, it's not what, it means. what kind of acquisition or perception causes unwholesome states to diminish, unwholesome states to increase, and one who cultivate, cultivates it? There is someone is uncovetous and abides with his perception, detached from covetousness. He is without ill will and abides with his perception, detached from ill will. He is uncruel and abides with his perception, detached from cruelty. Such acquisition of perception causes unwholesome states to diminish, unwholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it. So it was with reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One, because the acquisition of perception is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And the acquisition of perception is either the one or the other. The acquisition of you is of two kinds. I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And the acquisition of you is either the one or the other. So it was said by the Blessed One, and with reference to what was this said, Venerable Sir, such acquisition of you as causes unwholesome states to increase, unwholesome states to diminish, in one who cultivates it, should not be cultivated. But such acquisition of you as causes unwholesome states to diminish, unwholesome states to increase, and one who cultivates it should be cultivated. Another example for acquisition of perception that could lead to a uh, hate could be like uh, you are seeing somebody like a Democrat or Republican if you are Democratic. The commentary explains the differences. Doesn't doesn't really give it as a difference, but it the difference. Well, yeah, the difference is. The one, Chitupada, refers to the arising of the mind, say, uh, greed, mind. And, uh, the other one is, uh, it says, Bijas, the Hagataya, Sanyaya. So it's referring to Sanya that is, that is associated with the greed or the anger. So yeah, if, if you then begin to associate, uh, suppose a person has made you angry in the past, then you develop perceptions of that person related, to not just getting angry. It's now that, that you have a perception where you know, every time you see the person, you get angry. So it's the sanya that's associated with anger. And what kind of acquisition of view causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it? Here, someone holds such a view as this. There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, no fruit or result of good and bad actions, no this world, no other world, no, no mother, no father, no beings who are reborn spontaneously, no good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. Such acquisition of view <clears throat> causes unwholesome states to increase in wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it. And what kind of acquisition of view causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it? Here someone holds such a view as this. There is what is given and what is offered and what is sacrificed. 
There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There are good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. Such acquisition of view causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it. So it was with reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One. Because the acquisition of view is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And the acquisition of view is either the one or the other. Keeps repeating this word acquisition of view, acquisition of perception and so on. So is this like cultivation of view or a view that is... It seems like it refers to habit, like um, the, mm -hmm. the gradual... Uh, taking on so as opposed to the arising of a view if a view arises in the mind in the moment it's not really a view it's a thought but when you feed it and uh, cultivate it then you take it on that's just what i'm guessing out of it i i thought acquisition means like buying something it just literally means acquiring get just a fancy way of saying labba which means patilabha means getting yeah, but yeah, i'm not sure what the word. yeah because you didn't have that view before now you have it so that's uh but that's i mean you have to be clear there's no you that has it so what does it actually mean mm -hmm. i think the difference is between the arising in one mind and the um developing as a habit the pattern of arising or the what's meant by this world and the other world? uh usually the and present life and the next life isn't sacrifice creating suffering in oneself? It can be wholesome and it can be unwholesome, depends on the mind state. When they, um, earlier, Sanka said that, you know, if you look at someone and you find that person, um, you know, good looking or something like that, that can mean breaking up the precepts. Did I misunderstand what he said? Oh, no, I, I meant it can lead to some. Ah, See, okay. somebody's wife as beautiful, uh, obsessed with it, that can lead to breaking on the precinct. Okay, okay. You meant like if it's obsessing, but if you just look at someone, find the person attractive, but don't desire that person, and that is not breaking. Well, right? finding the person attractive is desire. I mean, that, yeah. that is. Already. Yeah, but about the precept, she's no, yeah, even, yeah, even, even finding the, even obsessing over someone is not breaking the precepts. It's, it's Agreed. unwholesome and really dangerous, right? The precepts are all about the physical actions taken as a the defilement. So if you don't ever act upon it, you have broken. Thank you. 11. The acquisition of individuality is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And the acquisition of individuality is either the one or the other. So it was said by the Blessed One, and with reference to what was uh, in it, and in reference to what was this? Venerable Sir, such acquisition of individuality as causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it should not be cultivated. But such acquisition of individuality as causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it should be cultivated. And what kind of acquisition of individuality causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it. When a person generates an acquisition of individuality that is subject to affliction, unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish in him, <clears throat> preventing him from reaching the consummation. And what kind of acquisition of individuality causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it? When a person generates an acquisition of individuality that is free from affliction, unwholesome states dif diminish and wholesome states increase in him, enabling him to reach the consummation. So it was with this, uh, so it was with reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One, Bhikkhus, the acquisition of individuality is of two kinds. I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. 
and the acqui acquisition of individuality is either the one or the other. Venerable sir, I understand the detailed meaning of the blessed word. Is there a better word for this, like, uh, than acquisition of individuality for or maybe an example? Uh, obtaining. It's, it means the same thing, but it just I think you're just not familiar with the word acquisition, and it is an odd. The individuality as well, Dante. It's like, for me, individual is like a personality. Right. So, atabhava is, yeah, it does mean something. I mean, it can easily be translated this way, but the way it's used, it's used, um, well, to describe, I guess, being, the way we use the word being. Individuality is not the best translation, honestly, because it has nothing to do with individual individuality or yeah. individuality. It has to do with self. Atta bhava means atta bhava. The bhava is like a qualifier to atta. Say that you're not actually talking about a self, but you say atta bhava to mean um, no, a, 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 a not self, self like a, a self, but not a self, like an individual, which is why he translates it that way. Like a person or a being. Atta Bawa probably best just think of it as being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being. I just realized that the being would be perfect for this. Like thirst uh, for being, right? Oh. It's, it's thirst for being. Um, yeah, but not in that sense. Thirst for being a being. Yes. Or patilaba means yes, obtaining, yes. Um, obtaining a, 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 a life, I guess. We don't have a word for it. Obtaining a, a, a personhood, beinghood. Like when you die from this life, and it is is no longer that that being is gone, but there'll be a new being with a new name next life. That's what yeah, Atababa yeah. means. Atababa means this be this this being that be a dog, a cat, this specific dog, this specific cat is a each one is a is an Atababa. Indiv so individual is probably the best word. It's just a bit misleading. This individual, that individual. That's how we use that word. For example, somebody can think of himself, I'm a soldier, I must kill to defend my country. Oh, I'm a, this is my job, this is how I live. Well, it's not quite, I mean, the, whether you think of yourself as one thing or another, you're still an Atabawa. That's nothing to do with your how you perceive yourself. It's you being an Atabawa. Sanka is an Atabawa. Like, the, the, there is an individual that we refer to as Sanka. It doesn't matter whether he changes his name or... Or even changes to a she, for example. You know, it's still one. It's still the same at the bottom. individual. The will probably. To live. No, it's not the will to live. It's the living, the the individual. So it is probably the most accurate word. It's just doesn't sound. It sounds like yeah, no individual word. Not a literal translation, but it's how we use the word in English. And I think we've been talking over you. Yeah, I'm trying to understand what acquisition of individuality means. Means that. Uh, the willing, the wanting to be reborn, the wanting for reborn. Uh, I think it just means the taking on a new life, the actual act of, of taking on a new life. Becoming a new being. Or obtaining, obtaining actually, so it's not even the taking on, it's the actually getting. So it's just a fancy way of saying being re being born as such and such. And it mean like acquiring an identity, like I want to be a champion so no, so no that's not what it means that like I, I don't think that's correct the idea that this is referring to being this type of person or that type of person it literally refers to being born as a dog or a cat or a dewa or that that specific being so not not just any human but a, this human so i was born as this human this is my atabawa for this life and then on the idea that uh, of uh, Habitual is that habit of yeah. uh, with each life wanting to for another for another rebirth and so on. Is that also at that level? The habit at that level. Well, I think the only place that habit comes into play here is talking about the sevita bar suttas. This is this sutta is about what should be uh, cultivated and what should not be cultivated. So certain types of Rebirth should be encouraged, and certain types of rebirth should be discouraged. But, I mean, it's a bit. Uh, it's encouraged, discouraged is probably a bit strong because, of course, no none is to be encouraged. But there are those that are conducive, and those that are uh, uh, the opposite of conducive, good and are helpful, and those that are 
So being born as a human is reasonably helpful, being born as a deva is probably more. Is it more desirable to be reborn as a deva? So there's, I mean, there's, the, the problem is if, if you have no understanding or interest in the Buddhist teaching, being a, a born as a deva can be problematic because you never have to be challenged. You never would think to seek out the Buddhist teaching. But if you have an understanding of the Buddhist teaching, say in this life, to be born as a deva is a real blessing because you bring with you bring that knowledge with you. And the deva realm is quite conducive. Someone who is interested in the Buddhist teaching. Especially, especially the other sort of circumstantial factor is that there are many Buddhists in heaven, various heavens, be surrounded by sakadagamis, I believe in some anagamis. I don't know about anagami, whether when they become an anagami, do they go straight to the, they immediately leave and be reborn in the Sudavasa from heaven. And Ajahn used to talk about these about anagamis, in the, uh, and I've never found any reference to it, but he would talk about people who are, are born in heaven and never come back to the human realm. So they go from the, the Deva realms straight to eventually to Sudavasa. So he called them Anagamis, even though they weren't technically Anagamis yet. They would never come back to the human world because they would be reborn as Anagami. They would, uh, sorry, they would attain Anagami. So he said uh, Anatapindika and uh, Visaka are, are both Anagami, but Technically, I think they're not. But they can then be arahants and they are. Well, my question is whether they immediately, uh, the anagami immediately, upon attaining anagami, is, uh, immediately finds themselves, uh, disappears in the deva realms and arising in the anagami, the suddhavasa. And so with an arahant, if they became an arahant in the deva realms, they might just enter into parinibbana immediately. I'm not sure. I, I don't know why I think that either. Okay, thank you. Maybe some, maybe some could have heard something about that. Attaining Arhanthood uh, doesn't necessarily you have a desire to end it right there, but they like as long as yeah, I just you have I mean like if you like I guess where I was coming from is like a, a peta. If a peta does something very wholesome, they immediately are transferred into the heaven realms yeah. because of the wholesomeness. So somehow I had this idea that the same thing, and I, it seems like I may have actually heard it from that. I think anagam is they they are. Uh, they go uh, have to be in the Brahma realms. I don't think they they can be in sensual unless, Right. Uh, so the well, the question is whether uh, if a deva be, attains anagami, do they immediately go to the Sudavasa or do they have to live out their life as a deva? I guess it makes sense that they would just live out their life as a deva. It may, may depend on the human, humans can't uh, do that, but uh, devas and uh, spontaneous beings, I think they can go. Another question is, an arahant has to become a monk, so if a deva becomes an arahant, then what happens? I assume nothing happens because they don't have to be killed. I think they, they are dead body. Well, that was my guess, but I, I'm not convinced that it has to be that way because it's so easy to attain nourishment as a deva that it's not like they have to go out of their way to attain it, to, to maintain their life. But they have to leave the... Uh sensuality behind even in the human world they have to live the day life so the deva realm there's uh, even higher forms of sensuality i i don't think that well, no uh, you, I mean, you don't have to leave sensuality behind i mean sensuality is just the six senses even if it's beautiful things you don't have to run away from it. what they leave behind is the attachments to that that are involved with living as a householder so in in the angel realms you could just live in a garden somewhere live in a live in a uh, paradise under a tree probably still serve i don't know it, I, I agree that it could be that they just pass away i don't think i think these are the sorts of things that aren't really uh, elucidated specifically because they don't they aren't pertinent to our lives as human beings and i think some of the rules like the the, the, the these rules like seven days or they be they or they pass away for example just kind of break down in heaven that heaven's a little more complicated is my guess there's a place that can support a life of a, a hermit or... yeah i mean suppose all the other buddhists who are not arahants uh, you know bring them food oh this is an arahant deva we should bring them food you know, i guess is it's more complicated i don't really know. even even pacheka buddhas even even when there's no sasana they still uh, leave the day left and go to the forest so maybe devas can do the same find a secluded place if 
there's such a thing in because uh one thing about uh deva Renums is that you get uh, uh names looking after you because of your birth karma you have uh heavenly pleasure so that might not be conducive to a life of not you get nymphs to you. yeah I, I suppose only if you're a heterosexual male right it is good that you understand the detailed meaning of my utterance which i spoke in brief without expounding the detailed meaning Dushar of Sariputra for venerable sir and of by me for by the blessed one Sariputra the detailed meaning of my utterance which i spoke in brief should be regarded second exposition Sariputra forms cognizable by the eye are of two kinds i say to be cultivated and not to be cultivated sounds co cognizable by the ear are of two kinds i say to be cultivated and not to be cultivated others co cognizable by the nose are of two kinds i say to be cultivated and not to be cultivated flavors cognizable by the tongue are of two kinds i say to be cultivated and not to be cultivated Tangibles cognizable by the body are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Mind objects cognizable by the mind are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Second elaboration. When this was said, the Venerable Sariputta said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I understand the detailed meaning of the Blessed One's utterance, which he has spoken in brief without expounding the detailed meaning to be thus. Sorry, Buddha, forms cognizable by the eye are of, of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. So it was said by the Blessed One and with the reference to what was the... Venerable uh, Sir, such forms cognized, cognized by the eye as uh, unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates them should not be cultivated but such forms cognize by the eyes as cause unwhole unwholesomeness unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates them should be cultivated so it was with reference to this that it was said by the present sariputta forms cognize by the eye of two kinds i say to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Sounds cognize, cognizable by the ear are of two kinds, I say. Orders cognizable by the nose are of two kinds, I say. Flavors cognizable by the tongue are of two kinds, I say. Tangibles cognizable by the body are of two kinds, I say. Mind objects cognizable by the mind are of two kinds, I say. To be cultivated and not to be cultivated. So it was said by the Blessed One and with reference to what was Venerable Sir, such mind object cognizable by the mind as cause unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates them should not be cultivated. But such mind objects cognizable by the mind as cause unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates them should be cultivated so it was with reference to this that it was said by the blessed one mind objects cognizable by the mind are of two kinds i say to be cultivated and not to be cultivated i understand the detailed meaning of the blessed one's utterance which he has spoken in brief without expounding the detailed meaning to second approval and recapitulation good good sorry Puta. It is good that you understand the detailed meaning of my utterance, which I spoke in brief without expounding the detailed meaning to be thus. In these paragraphs, the Buddha repeats verbatim 24 to 29 with the necessary substitution. Sariputta, the detailed meaning of my utterance, which I spoke in brief, should be regarded the third exposition. Sariputta, robes are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Almost food is of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Resting places are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Villages are, are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Towns are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Cities are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Districts are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated 
and not to be cultivated. Persons are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. When this was said, the Venerable Sariputta said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I understand the detailed meaning of the Blessed One's utterance, which he has spoken in brief without expand, expounding the detailed meaning to be thus. Sariputta, robes are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. So it was said by the Blessed One, and with reference to what was this said, Venerable Sir, such robes as cause unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish and one who cultivates them should not be cultivated. But such robes as cause unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates them should be cultivated. So it was with reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One. Sorry, Putter, robes are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Arms, food is of two kinds, I say. Resting places are of two kinds, I say. Villages are of two kinds, I say. Towns are of two kinds, I say. Cities are of two kinds, I say. Districts are of two kinds, I say. Persons are of two kinds, I say. To be cultivated and not to be cultivated. So it was said by the Blessed One and with reference to what was this said. But, Venerable Sir, association with such persons as causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates it should not be cultivated. But association with such persons as causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates it should be cultivated. So it was with reference to this that it was said by the Blessed One. Persons are of two kinds, I say, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. Venerable Sir, I understand the detailed meaning of the Blessed One's utterance, which she has spoken in brief without expanding the detailed meaning to be thus. Third approval and recapitulation. Good, good, sorry, Puta. It is good that you understand the detailed meaning of my utterance, which I spoke in brief without expounding the detailed meaning to be thus. In these paragraphs, the Buddha repeats verbatim paragraphs 41 to 48 with necessary substitute. Sariputta, the detailed meaning of my utterance, which I spoke in brief, should be regarded thus. Conclusion. Sariputta, if all nobles understood thus the detailed meaning of my utterance, which I spoke in brief, it should lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. If all Brahmins, all merchants, all workers understood thus the meaning of my utterance, which I spoke in brief. It will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. If the world with its gods, its maras and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, understood thus the detailed meaning of my utterance, which I spoke in brief, it would lead to the welfare and happiness of the world for a long time. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Sariputta was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So how do you... So in the beginning, um, when he says uh, the mentions the two kinds in the utterance, Buddha always says it's either the one or the other. And uh, I noticed that here uh, towards the end, I don't really recall the middle part. Uh, he doesn't say that either one doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I'm not sure his translation is, is quite accurate, but I don't, I can't do anything for that specific. Dante, paragraph 25 to 29, um, I cannot really understand um, when he talk about um, the senses, because he said there uh, can be also more or not of two kinds, but how this is going to be possible? Like, uh, I understand the mind object, we can cultivate uh, wholesome state of mind with meditation, but... Uh, for the senses, I, I cannot understand how they can be. Because when you reach Nibbana, everything. So my mind, this one is always unknown because you crave for it. That is cool. Just because something ceases doesn't make it unwholesome. Uh, it's a good, it's actually a good, uh, there's a good point there that sounds and sights and sounds and so on are, are not actually of two. Technically, they are neither wholesome nor unwholesome. Pleasant or unpleasant. On this paragraph, uh, this about what they can likely lead to for example if you watch some uh, that is uh, likely to uh, arouse lust you should uh, stay away from that such kind of sight yeah uh, that's so one like... way of one way of explaining it but i mean another way of explaining it is um, that it's talking about the process of seeing because yes technically seeing certain things is technically there's no seeing that that is associated with any kind of wholesomeness or unwholesomeness. 
the process of seeing, uh, right after you see, is uh, either wholesome or unwholesome. But yeah, probably he's just referring to something more practical, as Sanka says, like, you shouldn't uh, be looking at things that are going to make you lustful or angry. So, like, let's say that these uh, the senses are uh, the tool, because we use those one in meditation in order to understand what is the truth. Is that, yeah, I, mean, I, would is say, what... I would say that it's, you, you, do, you do have to, if you want to explain this, you do have to go deeper than just that, that there are certain sites that you should avoid and that sort of thing. On a deeper level, of course, there isn't anything to avoid. There's just, you should be cultivating, right? Sevita Ba, Sevita Ba, you should be cultivating um, experiences of the same object that are wholesome. So if given a certain object that you see, you should cultivate seeing that is wholesome and you should refrain from seeing that is unwholesome. So in other words, seeing that relates to liking it or disliking it. Yeah. On a deep level, it just means being mindful. Can I, having mindful. May I ask you to, uh, to make an example of what is a seeing which is wholesome and, and seeing that is unwholesome? You see and you say to yourself, seeing and you recognize it as just seeing nothing this more. Is yeah, well, wholesome. You but, see something and see it as you or yours, good or bad, or, yeah. like it or dislike it. Yes, I understand now. Thank you very much. Bob. Yeah, I would take it as the process of seeing, not because technically we know the moment of seeing is always going to be ethically uh, inert, so having, having nothing to do with wholesomeness or unwholesomeness. But that's ridiculous because practically every every process of seeing, uh, almost every one, is going to be wholesome. Or well, maybe not everyone, but yeah, it's it's. Quite susceptible to wholesomeness and all. When they say that you have to, does it mean for religious town citizens that you should avoid those places if they can cause the unwholesome state to increase? In the right. Yeah, it's usually personal. Like, suppose you have a lot of relatives in a certain town or district or so on, and we find that when you associate with those relatives, you just lose your monastic or your spiritual inclination and you get lazy or you get complacent or you get sidetracked or distracted. Or maybe in a certain area, there's someone who you're very attracted to and that sort of thing. Maybe in a certain area, there is food that you really crave for. Or in a certain area, there is food that is uh, bad for you. Like suppose you're lactose intolerant and you're in a village of dairy farmers. Well, you might think, well, practically speaking, that's not very good for me. I should go somewhere. Lots of reasons. But yeah, that's pretty, I mean, uh, conventional. It's not on an ultimate level. Again, technically, well, these things don't even exist, let alone can they be harmful. But practically speaking, or conventionally speaking. For example, if you go to Thailand and if you visit the uh, monastery, that might help you to cultivate wholesomeness. But instead of that, if you visit uh, the red light district, that's going to lead to uh, unwholesomeness. That can most likely lead to unwholesomeness. I went to the red light district once. Uh, it was my first night in, in Thailand when I was one, uh, 19 or 20, I don't know, when I was young. And to be honest, it was it was eye-opening and probably a fairly wholesome experience because of how horrible it is. Um, when, when Claudia was asking uh, her question about the senses, like uh, if you, I mean, any object, anything, if you look at it with wisdom, and wisdom is there, and you see it as it is, there will not be unwholesomeness. Yeah, there's even a story about a monk who attained Arahant just by looking at a beautiful woman's teeth. Yeah, but isn't that about uh, trying to deal with as much as you can? I mean, for your own protection, not to put yourself in a you know, situation when you have to face too much. I mean, in order to be able to observe something, uh, I you think should focus on not uh, any difficult uh, experience. You can turn it into practice and into a wholesome experience all the time, every time. You just have to be very vigilant and turn it into. Yeah, it just doesn't work practically all the time. Like take family, for example. Trying to be mindful around family is sometimes just a practically impossible task. You find yourself getting irritated and angry quickly. So, so y yes, it is possible, but usually the answer just usually it's not true that you can you be you being that that state of you at that moment 
you are not able to quite often, but can you train yourself to be able to? Sure, in the future you probably could if you were. Is it always unwholesome to be not mindful, let's say, being or just the chance of unwholesomeness are higher? It is, uh, I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that, but basically, yes. If you're not mindful, there's moha at the very least. Okay, thank you, Mate. So it has wanting to cross a river. So if you want to cross a river, why would you want to pick the spot where the current is the current is very strong? I mean, you are likely to get swept away. You want to pick up a spot where the current is not very strong, where you can safely travel to the other side without uh, getting drowned or swept away. So it's, it's a decision you need to make. Uh, yeah, except sometimes the place to cross is very far away, so you have to consider whether you're strong enough to cross where you are, which which relates to people's living situations. It'd be very inconvenient sometimes to leave your current living situation, but sometimes you come to the conclusion that you have to, even though it might be hard, you have to leave because you're just not able to cross here. But yeah, if you have the choice, choosing suitable places suitable people suitable people is probably the most important but if you have if you have the choice try and stay away from unsuitable individuals unsuitable not just people i suppose unsuitable beings there's a, there's this constant um or quite frequent we hear about people and their pets how pets can be meditators and their pets how pets can be a real burden my father is fighting with was fighting with my sister about her pet how they she wants them to get a uh, an electric fence an electric fence but one of those you know those yes it's a uh, not an electric fence but uh you get a collar and then it it shocks them when they go or it invisible or it invisible and so it's but you hear about people wanting to go to meditation courses when they can't because they have to take care of their pets and it's Suitable, suitable beings and unsuitable beings. Well, if uh, Prince Siddhartha could leave wife and uh, son, maybe being behind a bed, you can arrange something, something much less. I, I would imagine. A bit. I had one student who had to, who we talked about it, and she ended up having to bring her pet to stay during her course, which is ideal. Well, I have a disturbance. So one human turning into an arahant should have to uh, become a monk is that for their own protection like for being able to survive well the, it's not that they are compelled to it's that if they don't they just pass away and... did i misunderstand or you said about eight days or something like that? say seven days yeah you, you might be a bit of a rebel and say that's probably just an estimate for all we know, it's exactly seven days. Seven days probably because at the moment of attaining Anantuddhi, you can also attain Pala Samapati or Nirvana Samapati and stay seven days in that position and then he has to uh, come out of that. And then well, he, he has to... A bit of a speculation, but... Yeah, it's a speculation. Uh -huh. uh, uh, when you were discussing about the uh, anagamism and the, I mean, uh, to me, it's logical that uh, if they don't have to die on Earth as a human, when they become an anagami, I don't see why they have to pass uh, away to the Sudavasas when uh, they are a deva. Well, it's because you. S my thought was when you see, uh, as I said, a beta, when a beta does something wholesomeness, they're immediately transformed into a deva. So there is a... There is a immediate immediacy like if a deva gets very angry they immediately die yeah so it's something would... like that with the arahant uh, as a human too but uh, i was just trying i mean i i was trying to understand that for the anagam that is how long sensual cravings they also uh, really miss the suit mm -hmm. and they would yeah. they wouldn't want to be in a place where uh, nymphs are dancing and trying to entertain them trying to serve them so that's why you were talking about seclusion in in the heaven, right? Yeah, if that is such a place, probably they can stay there. I don't understand why having a pet can be unwholesome. Is it because they cannot go to the retreat? Or... Well, there's lots of reasons. People are very attached to their pets. So we have to get rid of the, all that attachment. Well, you can't just get rid of attachment. But yeah, cultivating attachment is not wholesome. 
But the big, the, what I was referring to was more just how often I hear about it getting in the way of someone's practice, creating uh, conflicts. Okay. But uh, when you say you have to get rid of them, don't do like how most people do. Like, yeah, people in the, the dogs give birth to like four or five puppies. They take them all to the nearest temple and dump them. <laughs> Yeah, but Sanka, I mean, uh, what I was going to say and what I thought you were going to say is uh, one of the huge problems that we find with pets, and I assume, well, probably less in Sri Lanka, is what do they do with them here? They kill them. They kill baby pets. You know, even breeders will kill the runt. Um, But when someone doesn't want their pet anymore, they quote unquote put them down or have them put down like it's like uh, there's some kind of toy that you can just recycle. Uh, and that's callous. That's not true. People are often very sad to have to, quote unquote, put their pets down, but it's still murder. I have heard that they do that in the West. I haven't heard of such things here, but uh, I imagine it happens no. uh, every now and then. No, the, the, if you get an unwanted litter of kittens, they'll just drown the kittens. Uh, oh, yes. That was, co- that was common when I was growing up. You put them in a paper bag and with some rocks and throw the bag into the pond. I tried once and I couldn't do it. It reminds me of that uh, Jataka story where a woman drowned a dog. She was drowned. Yeah. Countable number of lives because of that uh, bad karma. I made a video once about this. I ended up taking it down. And it, the fact that I took it down, I think, is also instructive. It was about how you shouldn't get, um, you shouldn't have a cat. Have have to have a pet there's no reason for them there's no benefit it's just they shouldn't exist in my mind not a thing that should exist i mean there's an argument my brother was i was arguing with my brother about this and he said that there's they, they may dogs may have actually and maybe cats as well may have actually helped the evolution of the human race in terms of um, yeah. i don't know like dealing with mice or that sort of thing I mean, I don't see that as a good argument from a Buddhist perspective. But, but it, it's, it's, you, have to, you have to understand the difference between taking care of animals, which is, of course, great. I mean, it's a wholesome thing to take care of an existent animal, but to go out and get a pet or to... The, the whole idea of, of, of pets, I mean, it, probably the best way to think of it is it's, it's a part of the uh, intricate net of karma because our pets are just us. I mean, it's just people who then have their relationship with the person who becomes their owner. And because of this karmic relationship, they become their pet. Maybe then the owner becomes the pet and the pet becomes the owner. And it's just this circle of life. I mean, it's a cycle of karma. Pets are very much humans, most likely. And it's just a, a sort of a exchange thing. But the problem that you, that you see with them is, is there's a real, atta- yeah, a real attachment and a lot of sensuality and there was such anger at at the video that i posted that i ended up having to take it down it's one of the only it's probably the only video or one of the only videos i've ever posted that got more dislikes than likes a lot of dislikes on the video and it was a pretty vile video i thought and i may have said something wrong it may not be i'm not trying to suggest that i'm right about everything but one one the, useful thing about dogs is that uh, they can guard your property they alert you to leave them. yeah but i don't like the idea of making a being useful like that uh you, i guess you could say there's a there's a it, it makes a good relationship yeah i mean we um, use all our buffaloes for farming yeah yeah but you shouldn't as a meditator you shouldn't have water buffaloes either <laughs> You're a meditator. What do you want with water buffaloes for farming? Some sort of livelihood, but I think it's a bad livelihood to have to deal with animals. I mean, there is some some sense. Like one one um, sorry, hor- edit. I'm interrupting you, but you were saying going to say about horses. An interesting thing that I'd never really thought about um, when I was in Israel. I offer this this Israeli monk and teacher. He was talk telling me about one of his students who raised horses, and uh, he just felt that she was really having to deal with issues of feeling what was it i think it was something like feeling controlled or something like that or, or feeling she had real re, some real mental issues he, he said and and he thought it was because she was controlling these horses like basically forcing the horses to do this and do that it was kind of eye-opening and that's thought provoking I, I don't know that i agree with him on everything that he's ever told me but um it's interesting to think of and there certainly is something there because you know you forcing other beings to plow fields it's not provoking i always saw uh humans actually yeah 
Yeah, well, that's what I they were saying. I don't think they want to work. Why would they want to work? They can find grass and wherever you let them. Yeah, I mean, the same goes kind of with pets and, and other animals because you're controlling them. You're telling, you're forcing them. You're, you know, what you, would, would you think as a Buddhist meditator that that's good to do with a human? Force them to do this or force them to do that? With the children, parents do that. A police, policeman. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good point with children. I once had one student who, who had a real problem with her daughter. And she, she was saying, you know, I know what is the right thing as a Buddhist to do is to just, you know, let go and, and maybe be a teacher, but that's it. But the police would arrest me if I don't control my daughter. She was in a real, she, this was a woman, a really interesting story because she was, came to Thailand with her husband and she came to do a meditation course. Uh, and her husband went to the beaches in Thailand. And after she finished her meditation course, she went to be with her husband. And she came back to do another course. Uh, in her second course, I think it was in her second course, she told me that she had been with her husband and had gotten pregnant. And then found out that her husband was had cheated on her with um, some Thai woman and was, right, was actually marrying, going to divorce her and marry this Thai woman. Anyway, the point being, she's this very... Uh, interesting case of a person who uh, has uh, is is has this motherhood thrust upon her after she no longer is interested in it because of her interest in meditation and so she was probably one of the best mothers you could ever think of um, but but the, the person who was least interested in it and so she was she had this forced upon her and had to raise this daughter who was just wild i met i met the daughter she came back to thailand later and not a bad person, but not a very um, disciplined person either. The daughter was very interesting, and we talked about this because the daughter seems to have been, she said she was sitting in meditation, and she felt some presence attacking her, like invading her body from the outside. She actually felt this, and she tried her best to prevent this entity from, from invading, but it overpowered her. And then when, when, the, when the presence overpowered her, she said she knew she was pregnant. Really interesting to hear. I don't know what that means exactly, but there was something going on. And it's like her daughter was something very karmic, very, very strong relationship that they had. But uh, her, her having to deal with, like, they were driving on the freeway and suddenly the daughter started kicking the steering wheel. And the freeways, in, this was Austria, I think, the freeways in Europe are you know, you're driving insane speed. And her daughter's just kicking the steering wheel. So she hit her daughter. This is what she said. She said, I didn't know what to do. I was, I couldn't think of what to do. And so I hit her. And I don't know what to say to that. I can't, I can't uh, alter it actually. It's in some ways, self-defense protecting them. Mante, isn't there a story about a husband who came to the Buddha uh, talking about uh, his wife, uh, mistreating him and taking up late and what was, and the Buddha said, I gave you, I, you had the same problem like, uh, this many lives ago and i gave you an advice i think then <laughs> i don't know whether there's lots of that. there's lots of stories like that i mean where the buddha tells someone they've had the same situation in the past life i can't immediately recall that i mean it probably is there's some, for some people i think the stick works uh, for some people yeah i mean there's this curious outlook that was hard for me as a western as a buddhist you really shouldn't try to control other people even if they've done terrible things. That um, being involved with convicting a person of a crime, for example, is not a Buddhist thing that you should do. If someone is guilty of a crime, even being a witness in, in a murder case, for example, is considered to be not a Buddhist thing. If you're involved with, if you know that what you say could cause someone to be incarcerated. And I, it, it struck me as, as surprising because I was thinking, well, you're just telling the truth, right? And uh, and I guess in my mind, in some sense, it was good if the person gets incarcerated. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that's true because incarceration involves imprisonment and Buddhism is about being free. But, but Pante, if he's a serial killer, you are saving the people from getting killed if he's incarcerated. Yeah, well, he's the one doing the killing. The, the point is that you are saving yourself from controlling others. That's the idea. Careful, because because our ideas from a societal point of view and from a worldly point of view 
may not be true, may not be right. My teacher was vehement. He said, uh, Ajahn Tong was, uh, he, he said, you just don't say anything. Or, or you know, if you see, if you, if, if, if it was in a case of a crime and you're asked to say something that's going to make them, make people catch the person. I don't know that he truly really understood what I was, because I, I brought it to Ajahn Tong because I was so surprised that the monks were saying you should, I mean, one monk was saying you should lie. And, and, uh, I went to, I, and they were so vehement, I went to Ajahn Tong about it. And he said, well, you just say something that's misleading. You don't actually lie. Like in, in Thai, you can say, if someone asks you, did you see this person? You can say, mai hin. And the word mai hin, mai hin means don't see. But it can, because of the way you say it, it can refer to the past or it can refer to the present. So he said, you look around you and then you say mai hin, which means I don't see right now. But it sounds like you're saying I didn't see because it, it's you say it the same way. You don't you don't have to use the past in the given. Isn't that called samyak prayoga? Mathe samyak pogadan no. What is a Pali term? In Sinhalese we call samyak prayoga. Like uh, uh, the, what the, the Buddha did with uh, Prince Nanda, promised him angels. It's, he didn't lie, but I mean he would have gotten angels if he had died and went to heaven without attaining. Enlightenment, but uh, still, a yoga means something like uh, means or uh, a yoga. What is a yoga? A yoga means like a device, a skillful. Yeah, device. So kusala upaya is what kusala kusala upaya is what the the Mahayanas. So a Mahayana Buddhist would would say that it's kusala upaya to kill sometimes, to lie sometimes. And of course, in Theravada, we would say no, that's... Isn't that uh, same as the story in Mahapada with when the bird ate the root and the hand, even though he was... That's right. That's a really good example. He was being beaten. As, so so if you, for those of you who don't know the story, it's a really good example. Thank you. Uh, this is Arahant who would go for alms round two, alms round two. He was planning a meal, but he was a jewelry, jeweler. And so he had this very, very precious ruby. And he, because he was preparing a meal, he had blood on his hands. He was cutting up some meat. And so the ruby had some blood on it. And he put it on the table and he said to the monk, he said, wait a minute, I'm just preparing the food. So you just wait here and I'll, I'll bring you some food. And this bird peacock or whatever that was in in the shop saw the ruby with blood smeared on it and thought it was a piece of meat in it and he comes back out and he sees the ruby is gone and he says to the arahant what happened to the ruby what happened? and the arahant is, is silent because he knows that if he says what happened the guy's going to kill the bird so he'll be responsible or he'll he will be not responsible but he'll be involved in it would be something that would lead to suffering and he doesn't want that so he keeps quiet and the guy the guy gets very very angry and eventually starts beating the arahant and beating beating him until he, he turns bloody and and there's blood all over the place and the bird seeing the blood comes over and is interested and look is looking for something to eat and the jeweler sees the bird coming and he gets very angry and he kills the bird. and the arahant is dying there on the floor and he looks and he sees the bird and he said, is the bird dead? And the guy said, yeah, and you're going to be dead soon too if you don't tell me. And the arahant says, the bird was the one that ate it. The bird ate the root and then he passes away. But, but uh, like I was just thinking about one's involvement in the justice system to be a little different than the story in terms of just coordinating the previous story that you said about self-defense and mm -hmm. Sankar's point about... Uh, uh, preventing others from being murdered, etc., as a form of extension of that self-defense from a societal point of view. And so uh, participating in a justice system might be considered like a self-defense kind of a societal self-defense. Basically, there's some goodness there is what I'm trying to say. I mean, I, as opposed I can, to... I mean, it was really, as I said, it was really hard for me to hear these things as a Westerner. Uh, I guess at the very least, you have to appreciate that um, convicting someone of a crime is not necessarily always going to be right. I mean, there are laws that are harmful, and just following the law is not necessarily following the Buddha Dhamma. So yeah, if it's a serial serial killer, you might say, well, at that point, it's reasonable. 
not the best thing for that person and the best thing for society is obviously for them to be in prison quite often like if someone stole something for example i don't think you i don't think it's true that our criminal system is actually the right thing even then if it is a serial killer if uh, there's death sentence in your country then probably better right. to stay silent right it's not have anything to do with it it's not your, really your problem and you make it your problem when you when you get involved my question is when you help like i don't know the law or said um i mean helping for convicting of, of of a person what effect would that have on the mind of what one meditate i mean it, well I, the, i think the salient point that they refer to is this idea of captivity you are inclined towards captivity it's this sort of this basic principle of of freedom and liberation as opposed to trying to control and contain and force force your will on other people uh, does karma mean that there's perfect justice in the universe and we don't have to worry about justice yeah i mean i, I maybe that's what that's a little bit too bold of a statement but but basically that idea and it's not even so much that there's perfect justice it's just that it, the the system is broken and it's 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 never going to be there's never going to be justice in the world really there's always going to be injustices and yes the, the justice is that people who commit injustice are going to get theirs but they can still be it still doesn't mean that that people are not going to be unjustly hurt by other people and it's just constantly constantly injustice maybe that's a better way to say it is there's just this constant injustice or maybe there's both there's the injustice and there's the justice but uh, the injustice is not uh, born out of fear so for example for what we were saying before about the prison like i think that the society have created this system of uh, imprisoned people because they are fear that they can commit uh, something bad instead of uh, try to healing the person for instance uh, if you teach them uh, meditation when they are imprisoned so maybe this one can actually help them to improve their life for sure for sure but but that's kind of missing the point that you forced them into the situation and uh, it's the forcing of course if you're going to imprison someone of course you should uh, working on rehabilitating them helping them to rehabilitate helping them uh, go through school for example is a very practical one take school uh, classes in in prison but of course uh, teaching the meditation obviously but it still doesn't negate the fact that you've forced your will on them i think an argument could be made that this this applies at least much more to monastics because an argument can be made for people living in society as having uh, sort of agreements and um systems you know the justice the, the criminal justice system and so abiding by those for lay people is probably a lot more reasonable whereas it's monks who have to be a little more careful about not getting involved and so to try not to get it, become a part of the process of the criminal justice system, just to stay out of it because of your monastic um uh, duty your monastic yeah if, if there is a tiger on the loose uh, in your village you have to catch him and uh, take him into a forest or jungle so in the same way if there's a, a psychopath or serial killer in the society who is not following the law you have to remove him from the society and put it put him somewhere else seen as a prison system or maybe another island <laughs> like how the british did with the uh, prisoners they brought them to australia yeah yeah i mean in, in cases like that it 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 sounds you it, it's easy to make it sound cut and dried but it, you gloss over the fact that you are imposing your will on another individual and you have to take that into it. because if you use that for justification for the criminal justice system writ large when someone uh, smokes marijuana and then you put them in jail for 5 years or 10 years you haven't done any good there. in thailand they used to kill people just for for marijuana i think usually for having large amounts it's the sentence uh, he- still active in thailand but uh, i thought uh yes i think it's still active i mean it's it's gotten a lot better it may have been revoked already i'm not sure but the, recently there was a sort of a decriminalization of marijuana 
ones like that as well. I mean, it's ridiculous because of how popular beer is and how accepted beer and alcohol are in Thailand. Well, cigarettes are not alcohol. Alcohol is just horrible. And I've talked about this before that when I was in Thailand, we learned that New Year's Eve is the second most dangerous time of the year. People just drink and drive like nothing and just slaughter. There are ambulances set up all over because of the, like we were living on top of this mountain and it was a big tourist destination. And we had a special ambulance for New Year's Eve because people would drive drunk up the mountain and kill themselves. The, the most dangerous is actually Thai New Year, which is around this time. We just, it's kind of just coming up this week or so. It's mostly because of alcohol and, and that's perfectly legal and socially acceptable. So in this case, enforcing the law and arresting the drunk driver to be ethical? I mean, I guess, again, it comes down to, I think there is a difference between the status of a monk and the status of a layperson. A monk should not get involved with arresting a layperson or telling the, calling the cops on a layperson, for example, calling the police. But um, for, for lay people, for, for people living in society, you still have to consider that you're enforcing your will on someone else. And there are often better ways. The biggest problem, I think, in most societies is the lack of resources. So police are, it's a lot easier to have a strong police force that just locks people up or even kills people. Uh, because it's yeah, there's lots of reasons. I mean, it protects, they can be corrupted and you, you can create thugs and, and politicians often like a strong police force that they can. But um, there, there's a lack of social services, a lack of mental health support, a lack of so social, no, lack of social workers, people who could actually help people to uh, have better habits. You know, if someone's drunk, well, there should be a place that they can go to sober up, which is often what happens. They get put in a jail cell overnight and they're never charged. They're just given a chance to sober up. I and mean, things like that are not unreasonable. You can't find answers, I think, in, again, in lay life or in practical worldly life, even for a monk. You just have to do it as reasonable and be careful of your intentions and your mind states. Controlling other people is an unwholesome mind state. There's problems there then monks cannot control anyone for any good reason. I think a Buddhist, an arahant would not. In the monasteries, uh, there are lots of rules and rituals. Those are... Ah, but the rules are, the rules are not controlling. It's up to each individual monk to confess their, their, their rules. There are, it's a good point. There are certain examples where monks will ostracize another monk. But again, you're not controlling them. You're just ostracizing them. You don't physically pick them up and lead, take them out of the monastery or lock them in a room or something like that. I've seen monks do that and it's horrible. It's just, they did this to, what did they do this to? In my monastery, oh, some of the horrible things people did. Monks are allowed, to, to, uh, monks are allowed to use physical force for self-defense, right? But, you know, so if a uh, crows are coming to take their, they can chase away. I mean, they don't have this. They are, it happen. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's something about animals that animals and humans are different because animals can't really understand but there's still there's not really anything about controlling others except in self-defense prevent someone from harming you like what they do with monks that are they ostracize them they go they'll even go and tell the lay community the supporters so there will be one monk who is appointed to go to the village and tell the lay people tell the villagers that this monk has been ostracized and should not be supported or i don't even know should not be supported but the monks do not endorse their support anymore. Basically telling the lay people, this monk is not worth. So isn't defending others a virtue? I don't know, but I think so. I think you could extend it and argue that if someone else is being harmed, you could act in self-defense. That seems reasonable. But not 100% clear. I think in the case of other people's defense, you have to take in the circumstances. So again, karma, karma, either you have to say that the Buddha taught against the theory of karma, or you have to accept that what the Buddha taught as karma is not actually karma. Karma is a word that means action. It refers to physical or verbal deeds that one does. And those things are not karmically active according to, they are not ethically charged according to Buddhism. So whether you do something or don't do something has no ethical consequence. The consequences are in your quality of mind, the state of mind. States of mind can be ethically. So you could never get an answer to the question of whether doing something or not doing something is ethically charged. They, 
they never are. So you have an answer that, that it is never wrong to do something. It is never wrong to not do something. The only wrong or right is going to be in the state of mind. That was a powerful and important teaching of the Buddha that is important for people to understand. Actions are not actually ethically charged. But there's still a connection between states of mind and actions. I mean, if I want my safety, I will I will do actions that lead to my safety. And if I want other people's safety. Yeah, yeah and what you could also say is that uh, the actions amplify the mind state. So if you want to kill some, you're going, it's going to be quite unwholesome in your mind. But if you actually act it out, the unwholesomeness is going to be magnified by the act. So this, the unwholesome states of mind are going to be much stronger when you actually carry it out. So it's not to say that it's trivial or meaningless to kill someone or so on. It's going to be a huge part of the bad karma, but the bad karma is always going to be the states of mind. An, an example for inaction uh, would be like uh, when potentially unwholesome. Uh, would be that uh, say you know that something is poison and somebody is going to consume it and you stay silent because you want him to die or become sick. Yeah. And the, the key there is you want that person to suffer, and that's what leads to the inaction. I mean, a, a fairly common one is suppose you pass by a beggar on the side, a person sit not a let's not say a beggar, a person sitting on the side of the street and they have a a, a cup or something and they ask you these alms for the poor or something like that. And you suppress any inclination. You you, you get you get kind of angry about it. You you you're afraid, or that you're thinking about having to lose money, and you don't like that idea, and so you just scowl and look away and walk on. It's very common not to do something nice for other people because of a, a stinginess or a greediness, or even just because of worry or fear or doubt about what is right. It's the easier thing not to do something sometimes hard to do good things. And so the mind immediately sometimes reverts to not wanting to do it. I mean, it it's a common habit. To take the easy way out. And that easy way out involves uh, stinginess and uh, cruelty, that sort of thing. States of mind that are unholy. Even though it's much easier not to do something kind for someone, it's actually far worse for you than actually taking the effort to do the kind thing. So would this be an example where self-sacrifice is the right thing to do? I mean, when you give up, say, a certain amount of money to help the poor? Oh, yeah. You, you would be pro probably many people would be surprised at how, how important self-sacrifice is and how far people should go in terms of, of giving up, letting go, and then helping others. The Bodhisattva gave his own body for a tigress. Uh, in the Jataka story, I'm not sure, in the Theravada story, but in order to save the cups from getting eaten by the mother. Just a second, did that actually happen? There's one story that's not actually a true the Jataka story. That's a special case because the Bodhisattva is cultivating a specific Paramita, uh, Dana Paramatta Paramita, so it shouldn't apply to everybody. I don't think that's an actual Jataka story, though. I think that's one that was... That was added later or by Maha. It's sort of a Mahayana story. Is that in the Buddha Vamsa? I thought it was a Mahayana story. There is a similar one that's in the Jatakas where the Bodhisattva was born as a rabbit. Sakka comes down to test the rabbit or something and is looking for alms, looking for, for food. And the rabbit is like, oh, here's an opportunity for me to sacrifice myself. And so the rabbit says to the Brahmin that Sakka was, uh, or not a Brahmin, some kind of ascetic. As this ascetic, he says, well, light a fire and I'll get you. And when he lights the fire, the rabbit first shakes its fur out because there might be fleas on its fur that would get it harmed otherwise. And then the rabbit jumps into the fire. But uh, Sakka catches him, right? Well, the fire doesn't burn him. It's not actually. It's magical fire. A similar, similar story about a king who wanted to learn the Dhamma and nobody knew the Dhamma. Then uh, Sakka came as a demon and I said that I know two stanzas of Dhamma, but you have to, I'm hungry, so you have to sacrifice yourself if you want to hear it. Then the king went up to a hill and said, uh, I will jump to your mouth, but while I'm happy, you have to recite the Dhamma. He I did don't remember that. that one. Is that in the Jatakas? Yeah, it's one of the Jatakas. I think he, he, he told, the king told his barber, if you see two white hairs on my head, tell me. So I think uh, 
people, human beings had long life uh, back then. So when after a long time, the king uh, started getting old and the barber noticed that there were white hair. So he robbed the king. So at that time, the king decided now enough of play life. Let me go in search of it. Oh, there's many stories. There's many stories. Of... Ante does just in bodily context and without liking or disliking it, can it be also a good way than our feeling, bad, good or bad feeling? What, what exactly does count as a way than a, like a feeling? Just bodily context or also if, uh, on the other senses, if I see something good or bad, or if I taste something good or bad? Well, Vedana is a part, is a jeta sikha, so it's a part of an individual moment of experience. So technically, um, each moment of consciousness has Vedana in it. At the moment of seeing or hearing or smelling or tasting or feeling, or seeing, hearing, smelling, there is, because the rupa is called Padaya rupa, is that what it's called? Because it's um, derived materiality, the, the contact technically is is insignificant and so there cannot be a painful or a pleasant feeling at all there also cannot be a happy or unhappy feeling because there has been no judgment but if you see something that's beautiful or if you see something that's ugly the contact between the eye and the the light or the contact related to this the act of seeing is inconsequential in the sense that it won't cause pain or pleasure when you feel something on the body, there can be pain or there can be pleasure, of course, because that's a different kind of rupa. It's whatever the opposite of upadaya. Earth, earth, earth element, the, 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 the three elements. And there can be yeah. heat or cold as well. There can be pressure as well, like in the stomach. Uh, so, so there will always be technically a neutral feeling in that moment. But the next moments uh, can have pleasure, uh, well, happiness or unhappiness, depending on how it reacts with the reaction. Okay, thank you. So when in the sutta state of these feelings, it's usually uh, referred to the body? Well, pain is yeah, bodily and pleasure is bodily, but there's also happiness. and But the, all of that is really very technical. I mean, practically speaking, you just notice when you're happy or unhappy, you notice when there's pain and pleasure. You don't have to be so technical about it. But yes, the question about hearing, seeing, hearing, smelling. The happiness or unhappiness comes after. It's not actually related technically to the experience. Uh, I was just wondering if there's, um, if it's good to prevent someone from doing something unwholesome. Um, like if you know they might steal from you, you put things in a safe, and that maybe goes for people in jail as well. I don't know. Uh, well, there's something different between those two examples. You're not controlling someone by putting something in your safe. You're controlling them by putting them in prison. Okay, but you also prevent them from doing something bad, potentially. Right, but you prevent them. If you kill them, does that make killing okay? <laughs> but preventing somebody from doing harm in releasing somebody else, and that has an, the effect of release, releasing some. Yeah, so I don't think you can weigh or any... Well, I don't know, maybe there are weight instances where you can, but it's mostly about whether you should get involved or not get involved and there are situations where it's hard to know whether you should get involved or two people are fighting should you get involved it's hard to hard to know sometimes i mean it's, it's, imagine the example where someone is sexually assaulting someone else I think it's usually pretty obvious that it would be right to get involved this ideal of non-action is very common in the eastern in the far eastern religion yeah there is some cultural, it's why I was kind of suspicious at first, because there is some cultural aspect as well. It's very cultural to not get involved. Like, great example I have is when I was a new monk and I, was, I had just, I had spent my first year as a monk in, in Canada and I came back to Thailand and I hadn't been there a week when we were sitting in the, in the um, dining hall for monks for breakfast early in the morning and suddenly... There's this clatter of a tray, and we look over, and this monk stands up and starts pounding on another monk and gave him a bloody nose. And I stood up. Of all the monks, I stood up and rushed over and grabbed the monk who was doing the attacking and held him, you know, put my arms around his, his, his biceps and 
held him, not tightly or anything, but I did hold him. And, uh, you know, that was enough. I think he, he turned and looked at me and shrugged me off and then ran away. Turns out he was a monk I knew quite well. But uh, but nobody did anything, and no one was, was going to do anything. And no one would have thought to do what I did as a Western monk. Not saying I did any better. I, I don't, I'm not analyzing it like that. It's just culturally, you might argue that it's a little bit um, on the passive side. Like, it's one thing to have a noble inclination to not interfere and control others. And I appreciate that. That's something that's hard for a Westerner often to see or a non-Buddhist to see. But there's also taking it as an excuse not to do the right thing, not to do good deeds in terms of calling people to account for their deeds. Sort of. Were you told later, Bhante, that not to react on those type of situations? Or would you do that if it happens now? Probably I would. I mean, it wasn't any kind of maliciousness towards the man doing the attacking. It was in defense of the other person. But it's, it's not about picking sides. And that's the point, is if it were about picking sides, you'd probably have an issue. It's about helping to resolve the situation because I grab him around his, his arms and he comes to his senses, you know, he, he just stops. He didn't try to fight me off or hit me or anything. I mean, hey, we're, we're, we're supposed to be, you know, brothers. And so, I mean, not trying to say that I did the right thing or my intentions were pure or anything like that. But I don't think, I, th I think there is room for that kind of thing. It's all about circumstance, what you're trying to do. I think I that's suppose pretty normal. There was... There was, um, there was, uh, I'll give you another example that I'm not sure I agree with. This is again, uh, this Israeli teacher, one of his students went crazy and it wasn't, it wasn't his fault. I think we, we established quite quickly that this woman was being driven crazy and she had her own issues, but she went crazy and he would, he started slapping her. He was slapping her and he, like on the face, you know, and saying that when he did it, she woke up a little bit, like she came back and. Honestly, looking back now, I really don't agree with his with, with his assessment of the situation. It's just horrifying to think, uh, looking back now. But at the time, it was kind of just, I mean, I didn't know. I was like, he was the big teacher. He, he knew what he was doing. But to be honest, even now, well, more so now, I think that's... But he, he had what, no, what you have to say is he had no malicious, malevolent intent. He thought he was doing something to help her. He was very kind and very patient. He was, was it a lay, lay teacher, Bhante? He was a layman at the time. He's now a monk. He's been a monk for almost as long as I have. But he was a lay teacher for many years. Because a monk wouldn't be able to slap a woman. And there's this wrong view that can occur in some people. I mean, in me, it certainly occurred for a time. That if you don't do anything or if you're as passive as you can be, don't interfere with the world, all things will and I think that the world doesn't just doesn't work that way. It was fascinating. Yeah, it, it's more complicated than just not doing anything. And you, you, you've got to you say it quite well there. I, that's that's it exactly. It's, it, it, pacifism is a is often the best way, and 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 non-action is often quite often the best. I mean, it's more often what it looks like. But there's always got to be action when it's necessary. And yes. When you do not do, when you do not act when you should have acted, that can be, and often is, very much based on unwholesomeness. It's not the case that every in every situation non-action is safe, and that's what people it's just easier not to do something. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, justify if you don't do anything when you do honestly, but it doesn't it feels like you be excused for not acting. I think it would, it's quite normal reaction, but uh, I can see a Sri Lankan monk doing the same if uh, two monks start fighting. But uh, the same monk yeah, but wouldn't try to stop uh, two drunk people fighting in the street. So it depends right. on the situation. But that's also a huge, huge world view difference between Thailand and Sri Lanka. They are very different places. Lay people would never treat monks in Thailand. Lay people in Thailand would never treat monks the way they treat monks in Thailand in Sri Lanka. And monks in in Thailand would not act like monks in Sri Lanka for the most part. Of course, people are people, and everyone's different. But the culture is so different. Like people yell at monks and criticize monks to their face in Sri Lanka, which is great. I I don't mind that. But very different in Thailand. And monks in Sri Lanka are very quick, and it was nice because I got 
I got put in my place by monks in Sri Lanka, which was good. And it's different. It's a different situation in Thailand. It's not that people don't say anything, but often they are very roundabout in their way of saying it. Hello, sorry. Um, I was wondering whether it would be an issue to be a lawyer as a Buddhist because you'd be involving yourself in all kinds of situations that could involve restricting people's freedom. Um, right, so a lawyer technically is not the worst. I would say a judge is a bit more problematic, right? A judge has to sentence someone. A lawyer just theoretically has to prevent, present the case. The real problem is the lawyer has to often uh, be manipulative. I think there's issues there. Theoretically, a lawyer is just just presenting presenting one side of the issue. They do their job to present one side. Now, one thing you could say in defense of a judge, say it's not a perfect defense, but again, they're just doing their job. They're trying to apply the law. The big problem is we, we well, a problem is we, we use, use structures as scapegoats. And it's a, a violence that was a very valuable, thoughtful uh, lesson that I learned in peace studies in university, that there's something called structural violence. Structural violence doesn't have any perpetrator. It's just the structures. So if you have laws that are violent, well, the people just say, I'm just enforcing the law. And so the structures themselves are, are causing problems. From a Buddhist perspective, you could look at it as, um, again, inaction. This, is, this relates to inaction. Structural violence is only possible because people don't recognize it and, and actively try to change it. It's much easier to say, well, that's the which is a ridiculous thing to say because laws are concepts and it depends on the people to decide what are the laws. So you use it as a scapegoat. There's uh, such a thing as a personal responsibility. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that's all there is in Buddhism. You're only responsible for your person. Very lively discussion this week. Have a good week. Thank you, Sadhu.